श्रीमती स्वप्नम भारतीय श्री संजय नारायण distinguished ladies and gentlemen i am glad to be amid you today but we meet in rather sad circumstances the demise of president nelson mandela he represented the conscience of the world he also remained a beacon of hope for those struggling against oppression and injustice long after he had led his own people to victory over such ills in a world marked by division his was an example of working for reconciliation and harmony and we are not likely to see another of his kind for a long time to come India regards him as a true Gandhian in spirit and ideal and joins the rest of the world in expressing a deep sense of gratitude to him for his work and teaching we pray for peace for his soul coming back to today's business let me begin by complimenting Shobhana ji for her enterprise and commitment in organizing this annual gathering every year over the past decade when i looked at the theme of each of your last 10 summits i noticed that you have consistently focused on india's future both on the opportunities and the challenges that lie ahead the media or by vocation duty bound to focus on the present the here and the now but i am glad that through initiatives such as this summit they take time once in a while to think about the future too in keeping with that spirit let me also use this opportunity to step back and reflect on the big picture as i see it i belong to a generation that was shaped by our freedom struggle and by our efforts at nation building freedom gave us hope independence gave us courage democracy gave us rights and responsibilities and nation building defined our charter ours was a generation that lived through nearly half a century of slow growth low industrial development frequent famines and little social mobility that india still exists for many of our brothers and sister but for fewer and fewer of them having lived through a past that was very different my generation constantly tends to compare it with our present and the stark fact is that as a generation we have experienced a transformation in our own lives that in our youth we never even imagined was possible there are millions of indians like me who have spent their childhood in a milieu of little hope and have then lived a lifetime of sweeping transformation this is not a function of the passage of time alone but of a combination of the effort enterprise and aspirations of the people of india as also the leadership and guidance provided by various governments at the center and in the states after half a century of zero growth between 1900 and 1950 we saw the annual rate of growth rise to 3.5% 
when we realized that other developing countries were overtaking us and had found new routes to development, we too changed our course in the, in the early 90s. In the past two decades, the rate of growth more than doubled to an average rate of over 7% per annum and the Indian economy was put on an upward growth trajectory. Naturally, there will be periods of ups and downs. The economic cycle presents at years of high performance and years of modest performance. But the important thing to note is that the highs are getting higher and so are the lows. Today, many people feel dissatisfied with an annual rate of growth of 5%, while for more than two decades after our independence, 5% was the target rate of growth of our five-year plans. Through all the ups and downs in the face of global challenges, and despite the burden of past policy mistakes, our economy is on a rising growth trajectory. This is the first lesson I draw from stepping back and looking at the emerging big picture. However, economic growth, social change, and political empowerment have brought in their way the new aspirations of an entirely new generation of Indians. This has contributed to growing impatience for faster growth and even better quality of life. These aspirations and ambitions are exerting pressures on governments to deliver more, perform better, and be more transparent and more efficient. A revolution of rising expectations is underway and I welcome it. What is truly significant though, if one steps back and look at the big picture, is that our democratic political system has been responsive to these expectations. Government have been elected and re-elected in every state of our republic through peaceful, fair, and efficiently organized elections within the context of an India that is changing faster than ever before. Once in a while, public anger may spill over onto our streets and into the media, but India's silent majority exercises its franchise in legitimate democratic ways to secure a change. Over the past two years, some well-meaning and concerned citizens have tried to spread cynicism by accusing the entire political class of being corrupt and anti-people. Many began to suggest that democracy had not served India well. They attacked the institution of parliament by refusing to respect parliament's judgment. Did that turn our people against democracy? Did that make them despair about the electoral system? No. Look at the voter turnout at every election over the past two years and in the just concluded assembly election. Even in the face of churning ambitions and rising expectations, the people of our country choose to vote and secure change through democratic means. This is the second important lesson I draw when I look at the big picture. Faced with the challenge of meeting the rising aspirations of our people and of ensuring the political sustainability 
of high growth, we defined a new strategy of growth that is widely termed as inclusive growth, making our growth processes socially and regionally inclusive has been the touchstone of our government's policies. Our strategy of inclusive growth has six elements. First is what I have often called a new deal for rural India. Investment in rural development, rural infrastructure, especially roads and electricity, rural health and education, and remunerative prices for rural produce. We call this Bharat Nirman. Second, increased public and private investment in education and health care with a focus on the education and health of young girls and young women. Third, livelihood, food and energy security for the poor. Four, a more transparent and responsive government made answerable to people through the right to information. Fifth, investment in skills and support for private enterprise, especially small and micro enterprises. And sixth, public investment in public transport, especially urban mass transportation. Taken together, these interventions have made our growth processes more socially inclusive. I cannot deny that there remain many challenges and problems and weaknesses in implementation. Our biggest challenge in trying to sustain this process of inclusive growth has been to bring rates of inflation down and keep the fiscal deficit under control. These remain a challenge, and I admit that, and they are being seriously addressed. Any sudden acceleration of growth, as we saw in the period 2004 to 2008, creates imbalances that can contribute to inflation. Such growth can also create opportunities for personal enrichment and that distorts governance and creates social resentment. Rising economic growth has helped to liberate millions of Indians from chronic poverty, reducing the incidence of poverty, but it has also widened social and economic inequalities. 